My name is Dennis Hatswick. I am the former vice president of the NUM Yorkshire area. I am also a trustee of the mine workers pension scheme. I think I ought to mention that Freddie Matthews, who was killed on the picket line in 1972, has his two nieces here today. And I want to welcome them both and say that we regard him as one of the heroes of the 1972 miners' strike. Our, Arthur will be referring uh, to Fred uh, later, uh, he has told me. Our speakers today are Alex Gordon, National President of the RMT, Ricky Tomlinson, leader of the Shrewsbury Pickets in 1972, a famous year, 1972. Ian Hodson, president of the Bakers Union. Uh, Sheena Johal from the Indian Workers Association. And I don't know who this last speaker is. <laughs> uh, Arthur Scargill, the National Union of Mine Workers. <laughs> As a, as a trustee of the Mine Workers Pension Scheme, I have to make it clear that I am not speaking in that capacity today, nor are any of my remarks to be taken as representing the views of my fellow trustees or the Mine Workers Pension Scheme Trustee Board. Now, with that disclaimer out of the way, <laughs> I want to welcome everyone to this meeting and to say that this is one of the proudest moments of my life and a tremendous privilege to have been asked to chair this meeting today, the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Salt the Gate. Comrades, it is our responsibility and the responsibility of future generations to ensure that working class struggles are celebrated and never allowed to be expunged from the history of the struggles of our class. The Battle of Salt Lake Gate was a victory it was a victory for the miners. It was a victory for the people of Birmingham, but it was also a victory for the whole of the working class. In the post-war period, leading up to the miners' strike of 1972, miners had fallen to 17th in the National Wages League. Miners working underground on a coal face with shocking wages. The pun often used was that a miner took his wage home, he threw it onto the table, and it took it half an hour to float down and land. 
After the end of the 1972 and 74 strikes, miners were propelled to the top of the wages league by determined and militant strike action. Today, we are here to celebrate the Battle of Salt Lake Gate, but also to recognize that, working, that the working class are always in struggle and to identify ourselves with those struggles, however big or small they may be. It was William Shakespeare that said, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take up arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. Well, in 1972, that's precisely what we decided to do. Rather than suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that we have suffered for long enough, miners decided it was time to take up arms against the sea of troubles. In 1972, led by Arthur Scargill, we embarked on that course. Due to pressure of work, Mick Lynch is not to be here, uh, but the, uh, the RMT secretary is unable to attend, but Alex Gordon, uh, the national president of RMT, is here to take his place. So, comrades, it is with the greatest of pleasure that I introduce Alex to address the meeting. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Ken. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good morning, comrades. As president of the RMT, the National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers, it gives me great pleasure and a considerable amount of pride to join you today in Birmingham to celebrate the Battle of Saltley Gates. 50 years to the day since that great moment of organized working class unity that led to significant victories for our movement and for working class people during the 1970s. In this year, 2022, a year when the 575,000 pounds a year governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey calls for moderation in wage increases to help curb inflation currently running at over 7.5%, we need to learn the real history of what happened at Saltley Gates from the people who were there. I'm honoured today to speak alongside Arthur Scargill, who along with Frank Watters, Jock Kane, Tommy Dignan, and other communists from the Yorkshire coalfield, laid the foundations for a great victory for working people and shifted the politics of the NUM and the entire British Labour movement to the left. Watters in particular moved from Yorkshire to Birmingham and built the Liaison Committee for the Defence of Trade Unions as branch secretary of the CP Birmingham branch. And I was only five years old in 1972 and my memories of the 1972 miners' strike the first national miner strike since 1926 is of being taken to Woolworths by my mother to buy a pair of gloves because it was a cold winter. And the whole store was lit by emergency lighting due to the power shortages caused by the extremely effective miners action. And when we left the store and emerged into the daylight, I found that instead of a pair of brown gloves, she had bought me a pair of purple gloves. And I said to my mother, I can't wear those to school. The kids will laugh at me. And she said, well, we're not going back in there. You can't see your hand in front of your face. 
Other members of my union have got more direct personal experiences of Saltley Gates. My comrade Ian Allen, RMT's National Executive Committee member for the Midlands region, remembers his own father, Ken Allen, a member of the Amalgamated Engineering Union who worked in the Austin plant near Saltley, coming home after taking part in the march to shut the gates. And he recalls then being taken to see a performance of the play, Shut the Gates, by Banner Theatre a few years later. In 1972, working class people were making history and they were making culture that celebrated their own history. The 1972 NUM strike was marked by a very high degree of class solidarity from the most organized sections of the industrial working class across Britain. That solidarity didn't happen spontaneously. It was built over years and decades by industrial trade unionists, and in particular, members of the Communist Party, patiently educating and organizing miners, engineers, dockers, railway workers, amongst many others, as part of a disciplined labor movement to break the Tory government's incomes policy, what we call today a wage freeze, and bring about an alternative economic policy in Britain, which would open the road to socialist advance. The historic relationships between the railway workers in particular and the miners has always been a close one. There were similarities in the publicly owned coal mining and rail industries in the 1970s. Successive governments worked on the assumption that coal and railways were not as important to the economy as they had been. The coal industry had been shrunk by 400,000 workers between 1950 and 1970, and the rail labour force had been cut by 350,000 workers in the same period. And there was a long and proud tradition of solidarity between miners and railwomen. In 1912, members of my union, the forerunner of my union, the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants, which in the following year merged to become the National Union of Railwomen, refused to move coal when the miners were involved in their first ever nationwide stoppage. In 1921, on Red Friday, when the Tory government tried and failed to cut the miners' wages, the NUR was part of the triple alliance with the miners and the transport workers. At the time of the general strike in 1926, the railways were brought to a standstill by NUR members and members of other railway unions, striking in solidarity with the miners who were locked out for refusing to accept savage wage cuts. And the same solidarity was shown again in the early weeks of 1972. In a branch circular issued by the then NUR General Secretary, Sidney Green, on the 6th of January 72, members of the NUR were instructed and advised against entering colliery precincts and warned not to do work normally performed by miners. No oil was to be carried into power stations where coal was a normal fuel. And on the 10th of January, the day after the strike began, the NUR executive carried the following resolution unanimously, that we declare our solidarity with the miners in their present struggle and decide to set up a special subcommittee for the guidance of our members. The special subcommittee to consist of eight members of our negotiating committee. But the NUR's support wasn't confined to pious resolutions in the boardroom of Unity House. A decisive feature of the 1972 strike was the high level of solidarity displayed by railway workers and seamen themselves. Railwomen were active in support of the miners in all the principal coal fields. And in South Wales, the representatives of the NUR, the Transport and General Workers Union, ASLEF, the National Union of Seamen, met on the 14th of January, just four days into the strike, to plan a campaign of picketing in a mass demonstration in Cardiff on the 27th of January, 1972. 10 years ago, one local NUR official, brother G. King, wrote to the Birmingham Post and Mail on the 40th anniversary of the Battle of Saltley Gates as follows. At the time of the Battle of Saltley Gate, I was the chairman of the NUR branch at Saltley Rail Depot and noticed the lorries going into Saltley Gas Works. I reported this by telephone to the miners' strike centre at Leicester. The outcome was that the next day, two coaches of miners turned up for a picket. 
At that time, I had a friend who had been an engine driver at Saltley and now had a cafe at Saltley. He kept the miners well supplied with tea and sandwiches in the early days until the numbers swelled to hundreds as the miners were joined by other trade union members. 50 years on from Saltley Gates, we can see that capitalism in Britain continues to create terrible poverty, housing and health crises for working class people. Imperialism, including the subaltern imperialism of our own government, acting in its well-practiced role as a poodle of US imperialism, is leading the world to the brink of a nuclear war with Russia and China. We need to relearn the lessons of the heroic events of Saltley Gate. We need to fight back for peace and socialism as a disciplined labor movement, to break the Tory wage freeze and make Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, rue the day he called for moderation. Solidarity, comrades. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker needs little introduction from me. He was a leader, along with Des Warren, of the Shrewsbury dispute in 1972, the same year as the Battle of Salt again. Ricky. Along with Des Warren, who is no longer with us, were both totally innocent of any crime other than leading a working class struggle for which Ricky spent two years in jail along with Des. Des was made to pay with his life for his commitment to working class struggle. And that is why we must never forget the struggles that we have been involved in. Ricky Tomlinson, it is our privilege to see you here today. Please give Ricky a warm welcome. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and brothers and sisters, comrades. What? I, I don't know, I can't read it. I'm a theatrical. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades, I am delighted to be here today. Mind you, at my age, I'm delighted to be anybody. <laughs> but when I came in and I seen Arthur and I knew I was here, and I've seen the cameras there. I thought they must be making another episode of the Undateables. <laughs> <laughs> but, but listen, I don't know anything about Saltley Gate, so that's why I'm going to only speak for a couple of minutes. I would rather do half an hour of Q and A, and you can ask me anything, even about my sex life. <laughs> There's nothing bad, but I would go anywhere with this man. I hold him in the highest regard. I love the bones of him. And what we went through at Shrewsbury was horrendous, but it's not a fraction of what society and the establishment done to that man and that man's family. What they done to him was outrageous. It was bad enough for us. Telephones tapped. Bagel in the house. Yeah, bagel in the house with my wife and two small boys in it. In a lovely, a lovely little cottage. A lovely little cottage where I'd re-roofed it and a plaster by trade. I've done all the walls, I've done it all, and I lost it, I lost it, taken off me, repossessed, back, back to square one. But you know what? We're made of stainless stuff than that, so we bounce back, don't we? I got a lucky break and got into the film industry. And there's a lad called Tony Legend, 
who when we were we went on trial, we got found guilty, and then we, we appealed. And so we'd been in jail five months. And we went to the appeal court and they let us out for five months while they, while they decided whether we should go back to, to jail or not, you know. Anyway, after the five months, we went back. And we should have been, the case should have been heard by a fellow called Lord Justice Salmon. But when we got to the, to the Old Bailey, who was sitting in the dock only Lord Justice Widgery, the number one man. And he listened to all the legal arguments for three days. And within three minutes, he said, send them back to jail. Mm -hmm. And we went back to jail. And as I say, when, when no one had touched us with, 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 with a barge pole, but there was a lad called Tony Legerton. And he's, just, he's a joiner steward. And he, he, he eventually got me and Desi a little job brushing the floors. as supposed to be joiners laborers, you know. Desi was a steel fixer. I was a city and girls plaster. But if you get off the job, you take the job. And years later, years and years later, I just come back from Brazil, from doing a movie with Johnny Vegas, John Thompson, Sasha Baron Cohen, staying in a great big hotel, $75 a day or whatever it was to get your evening meal, but big wages, your own chauffeur, your own car. And I'm back, so I've come back to England and I'm driving along the road and I've only got, a, I drive a Skoda. I'm not into cars. Cars are nothing to me. I don't know. I don't know the difference between a Mercedes and a BMW. All I know is I've got a brand new Skoda, and it gets me from A to B, and that does me. And this Tony Legend, the lad who gave me, who went out on the limb, by the way, to give me and Desi a job. He's standing in the bus stop, and he's soaking wet. It's tearing down. So I pulled up the car. I wound the window down and said, "Tony, get in." And he's a joiner, he's a joiner, I'd say. So he's covered in bloody sawdust. And he said, I can't get in that. He said, it's a new car. I said, it's a bit of bloody tin. Get in. He said, Rick, I can't get in that. He said, I've got mud all over me bloody. I said, Tony, get in the bloody car. You're soaking. So he got in and put <coughs> the windows up and put the heaters on. And the steam is right coming up off him. Honest to God, I had to put the windscreen wipers on. The bloody steam is coming up. So he said to me, where have you been? What have you been doing? I said, I've just got back from uh, oh, South Africa. So I've just got back from South Africa. Been doing a big, a big movie, big American star, Satya Baron Cohen, Johnny Baker, so this, that, the other. Staying in the presidential hotel. Said, we had our own chauffeur. I said, we used to get an evening meal. Everything was laid on. I said, you couldn't be, anything we wanted to do. I said, and I said, the money was fantastic. And he looked at me and he went, don't you miss the building game? <laughs> Don't you miss the building game? <laughs> but you know what? He still phoned me up and I look him like I love this fella because he'd never be safe himself. But listen, I was living in North Wales. I'm a scouser, obviously, as you know. And a little bit about my background. I, I was, we lived in a two up, two down terraced house. And we were the posh ones in the street. Not because we had any more money than anyone else, but we had electric. We had electricity. So we had a radio that worked off the electric. Everyone else had gas lamps. And now and again, you'd go in your mate's house, you'd be messing around and you'd, you'd smash the bloody mantle, whatever they called it. And it'd be made, and well, we didn't have that. We had electric light bulbs. So that was through sort of us, four lads, and my mum and dad, two bedrooms. So four lads in the big bed, in the back bedroom, and my mum and dad in the other book. My mum and dad, my mum had three jobs. My dad was a baker. He worked 27 years on nights, never out of work. So, we, we, we knew about the worth ethic, you know. So as I say, we went to, I went into the building industry, ended up going to live in North Wales, got married, living in, as I say, living in a little council house and working on the Rex and Bypass. And the strike was called, the building strike was called. And, you know, the pickets come on the side, called a meeting, the lad called Barry Schreck said, look, this is it, this is what we're out for. Well, to be fair, a lot of them lads in North Wales have never been in the trade union. But anyway, fair, fair, you know, they, they voted to come out on strike and uh, most of them joined, joined the union. And he said to me, will you be the mouthpiece? And I said, yeah, that's what you want. That's what you want. I'll do it. And, and, and we did. Anyway, I'm working one day on the site and two fellas come to see me in suits, put their arms around me. He said, all right, Rick. I said, yeah, not bad. He said, uh, listen, this is like after the strike, we feel the strike had gone. He said, we want you to do as a favour, we want you to be a prosecution witness for what went on. I said, you want me to be a prosecution witness? 
I said, I was in charge here. I said, these lads went and picketed everywhere I asked them to go. I said, how can I be a prosecution witness? He said, well, we'll have to do you. We'll have to do you. I said, well, you'll have to do it. That's the way it is. So that was the start of it. The next thing is, my wife, my wife, my bride, she'll have only about four and five at the time. And she's batting them in front of the fire in the old fashioned bungalow back, you know, pushing the two lads. Next thing, knock on the door, police comes in, put your coat on, come on with us in the back of a police car to the police station, blah, blah, blah. And there was some other lads there, you're all under arrest. And I've never been in trouble with the police, never. So I didn't know what the score was, but I should have realized because the next thing, we're taken out, we're put in a police car, and we're driven somewhere. There's motorcycle cops in front of us, motorcycle policemen behind us, police cars behind us, and a police van with dogs in behind them. Now, the six building workers, well, we haven't robbed the Bank of England. We haven't done. And anyway, the next case, so they take us to Shrewsbury, to the prison there, and, and whatever, and then and that's where we're charged. Photographed, fingerprinted, done all that. We haven't been charged with anything there, by the way. And, and that was the start where I said, this is obviously going to kick off. There's something more serious to this than meets, meets the eye. And what we should have known is the site that I was on is run, that area is run by the McAlpine family. It's run. In fact, there's been a member of the McAlpine family has been the high sheriff there for the last 10 or 15 years. So you've got no chance. When you take the McAlpines on, that's it. Anyway, cut the story short, but we, we get charged. For the picketing that went on in a place called, funny enough, was called Brookside. The site was called Brookside. Not the same one that I went on later on, by the way. And uh, there was 80 policemen with us. 80 policemen with us on that day. So Jesse's one half of the site, I'm the other half of the site, calling the lab together, having the sort and saying, come on, lads, it's a national strike. It's a national strike. It's the only one that's ever been called in the building industry. So the next thing is, uh, we're getting the lads, the policemen are there, they're just walking around. They never took a name and address, they never cautioned anybody, and they never arrested anyone. And we went home and that was it. Three months later, three months later, we were arrested and charged with 275 offences. 275. And I'll never forget it. The trial was in Shrewsbury Crown Court. And the judge was a fellow called Justice Mays, M-A-I-S, who'd never done a criminal case. He was an ecclesiastical barrister who'd been elevated to take this case. So we go in, and I didn't have a clue. So we go in, there's just six of us in the dock. So the next thing is one of the QC said that you want to down below in the, uh, what they call the holding cell, big cell. So the six of us are there, and, and a QC called David Turner Samuels, and another QC called uh, John Platts Mills came in to see us. He said, now listen, we've done a deal with the prosecution. If you plead guilty now, you're gonna get fined 50 quid. The union are gonna pay the 50 pound. It's 10 o'clock now. You'll both you'll all be back home in your houses for 12 o'clock noon. And the first four lads took it. And I was there, I was number five. And he said, what about you? I said, no, you're not off. I said, not me, no. I said, I'm not guilty and I don't want you 50. And, and Jesse Warren said, don't even bother asking me. Don't bother asking me. So that was it. The other four said, well, if you two plead not guilty, we'll have to plead not guilty. And that's what he did. So the six of us then were in the top. On the day the actual trial started, there was the biggest police protection there that has ever been Bigger than for the Crays, the Richardsons, the Tibbs, IRA bombers, the lot. There were 700 policemen shoulder to shoulder right round the courthouse. There was dogs. There was a, a, a cameraman on top of the statue outside of the Crown Court. There was motorcycle cops hidden in the, the railway arches things just a little bit out of Shootley. It was around, what's going on? This is ridiculous. And I was late getting there. I was late getting there on the morning the actual trial started. And I went to go in and these couples said, you can't go in there. <laughs> oh, I said, that'll do me, thanks very much. <laughs> he said, what do you want? I said, well, I'm not sure, well, you better go in there. 
<laughs> so I go and say, no, that's just that. I've never been there. And he, what he done, they made us sit in certain places. You sit there, you sit there, you sit there. Des, uh, me there and Desi here. That was the, the order we thought we were going to get there, but we didn't know that. So two of my brothers came to the court. None of us have ever been in trouble. So they're upstairs in the public gallery. And uh, you know, he told me this recently, my youngest brother. He said, uh, we were sitting in the public gallery, and he said, uh, this copper come and said, uh, you two, relations of Ricky Tomlinson. She went, yeah, he said, come with me. So we took them, we took them out, took them down this little room and said, what are you doing here? He said, what? He said, my brother's on trial. He said, I know, but what are you doing here? He said, I've just told you, my brother's on site. He said, we know that, but I want to know what you're doing here. So our David is about, he was about six foot three, our David, he went home the age of seven. So the next thing, he let them go and he come up. He done it again. He said, we'll wait to see what happens to him. So the next thing is the fellow with all the gold braid on and all that, you know, looked like a modest dance, he had medals. <laughs> He came up and he said, can I ever wear these? And he called them both out. He went, look, both are sorry about that. That shouldn't have happened. That shouldn't have happened. But anyway, it didn't matter. But what, what I want to say is, the trial went on. It lasted for 55 days. 55 days. I was in the witness box for three days. And the trial cost him today's money between 25 and 30 million pounds to put a few building workers in jail. It was absolutely horrendous but what i didn't know when when, when the jury went out and, and they, they, they were split eight four it was split eight four so the judge said to look i want to go away and have a think about it discuss it again then come back if you can get a different fit well immediately his instructions are out a bang out of order they're not allowed to discuss the case outside the jury room and he's telling them they're going to a hotel to spend the night, so they're going to have a drink, aren't they? And then he said, discuss it again. Totally out of order. He didn't have a clue. He didn't have a clue. Anyway, they come back the next morning, still 8-4, and, and, and uh, the judge said, well, look, just go and have another, you know, a little comms lab. So the next thing is, they come back and he went, um, we've got a guilty verdict, um, 10 to 2. Majority of 10 to 2. So... He said that was it. So he was able to sentence us then. So what we found out later, because there's one of the lads who's been involved with us, a lad called Sean Walton, his father, was either the jury foreman or the assistant foreman. And he said, what happened is, the court bailiff went into the jury room and said, what's all the fuss about? What's all the fuss about? If they get found guilty, they're only getting fined 50 quid and the union's going to pay it. And I know that to be true, because that's the deal that they offered us. Anyway, that's as I say, the trial went on, we were found guilty. So me and Desi decided we want to make a speech, we were going to make a speech. And the judge said, if you make a speech, I can laugh about it now. He didn't have a clue. He says, I can double your sentences. If you make a speech, now this is going to be a free thing, and you, you know, to put the, your side of the speech. So I, I, I made a, you know, I, I, I made a speech and Desi made a speech. And then he handed the sentences out, blah, 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 you know, suspended, suspended, suspended. Come to me, and we were only done on three charges, but the charge on, on each of them was conspiracy. So I was sentenced to two years on each of the three charges, but to run um, and come at the off whatever it is consecutively. So we were only going to do the two. And Desi got three, three threes. He got three years. And, and that was the start of it. And of course, when we went in, me and Desi have decided right away that we're not going to soldier. We're not going to do it. So right from the word go, we were a pair of they had a little shit to the establishment. We wouldn't do anything. We wouldn't work. We wouldn't wear clothes. We spent most of our time down in solitary, solitary confinement. And do you know what they used to do? Because as I say, I've never been in prison. They used to get us out of like Jesse if you say over there in a cell, and I'd be over there in a cell. So they, they kept us apart. You know what they used to do? They used to get us up about seven o'clock and take the bed out, take the bed out the cell and throw a bucket of water on the floor. So you'd only have a wooden chair to sit on, and you're trying to keep your feet up. Now, they'd done that for ages, and when it didn't matter. But Desi sometimes, Desi was a different character. Sometimes Desi would take the base, and he'd rear up on them, and that's what he wanted. 
It's like they'd go in and effing, effing, start effing and blinded to death. You'd square it up and all that. They'd come in and they start swearing to me. And I said, oh, is your mother know you swear? <laughs> They've got nowhere to go. They've got nowhere to go. So as I say, I spent probably most of my time in solitary confinement. And as I say, we went on hunger strike. And Jesse Warren never, he didn't laugh very much, Jesse, but I loved him. I loved him because he was genuine. And he had, he had a funny, he had a funny thing. He was so manly. He, he didn't like giving an inch. And I remember I, I, I had a radio and I used to listen to the radio and I used to put it by the, the, the hot water pipe going through the wall so I could listen to it. So I'm listening to a play and it was called Lady of the Camellias. It was on Radio 4. And it's a, it's a love story. It's a love story about a, a nobleman in France who falls in love with a, a, a prostitute. We'd call him a baggy, wouldn't we? He'd be a bag. In French, he'd be a baguette. So, <laughs> And, it's, and that's it. And, and she, she's got consumption. And she's trying to give him the elbow. She's trying to get rid of him for his sake. And he's saying, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. I love you. I love you. So I said to Desi, I said, Desi, I heard a wonderful play there. I said, oh, I said, you, he said, he said, is it repeated? I said, it's repeated on Sunday afternoon. He said, well, switch the virus on. He said, no, I'll listen to it. I'll never forget it. He couldn't, he couldn't give in for a minute. He's listening to the play, and it's the part where, where the hooker is telling the nobleman that she wants nothing to do with him, to go away. She's not in love with him. She doesn't want nothing to do with him. And he's begging her. He's beseeching her. Please, darling, I love you. Please don't do this to me. My heart will break. Please, please, please. And Daddy said, you sniveling bastard. <laughs> I said, Desi, it's a play. It's a play. But as I say, I loved, I loved him honestly. He, he never, he never, he never gave an inch. And as I say, what we didn't know, he then split us up after a few months, obviously. He split us up. And I didn't know, but he was getting the needle then, see. And he was taking the liquid kosh. He was taking the liquid kosh. And that's why his health started to deteriorate. And then I, I went in the Leicester prison, and the governor of the Leicester prison had been an ex-bricklayer. Who, 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 who'd got out the, the, the building game because he, he had arthritis in both hands and he couldn't hold a trowel. And he said to me, listen, Rick. He said, listen, you are a political prisoner. I said, I know that. He said, look, just do your... He said, you read this book? He said, what is it? He said, he said it's called The Ragged Trouser Philanthropist. He said, no. He said, well, read it. And he gave me that book and it changed my life. That book changed my life. And I've sent copies all over the world, honestly, I've even sent them to China, China, Canada, Australia, you mentioned it. People read about it and, and they write in and I, you know, I, I send them. So we had, we had all that, but we then decided, the Labour, the Labour Party kept letting us down, and I can't beat about the bush and I can't say this, they let us down, they let us down, they'd send in this is happening, that's happening, nothing was happening, nothing was happening. So Desi said, look, we're gonna have to go on hunger strike. I said, okay. So he said, you know what the scholar said, yeah. So um, we, 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 we went on hunger strike. So um, af after a while, they, they put me in the hospital, in the hospital wing and they put Desi in the wing. They put Desi in, in like the third floor maybe and I'm on the, on the ground floor and the weight's falling off me, the weight's falling off me. Well, my beard, my beard was down here. Then. My beard was oh, like that. Down there. <laughs> and, and it's the only time I've seen Desi laugh, he said. <laughs> The fellow come down, he went, listen, he said, uh, your mate's upstairs, Warren. He's been eating for about three days now. I said, no, he hasn't. No, he hasn't. And then he'd go up to him and say, I don't know what you're doing. Tom has been eating for the last couple of days. He said, no, he hasn't. No, he hasn't. And then we got, we, we, we got a, a, a telegram off the Labour Party. Things are moving. Please, please, come off the hunger strike. Things are getting sorted. So they said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I can't do nothing until I speak to my mate. And he went up and said to him, what are you going to do? He said, I can't do nothing until I speak to Tomo. So he said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll give you half an hour in the prison yard. At, at, well, at, say one o'clock, you, you can both go in the prison yard and have a natter. So I said, okay, because we're not wearing clothes, I got a blanket and I ripped the middle out and I put it on. So I'm, I'm stark as accepted this. It was like a poncho on me then, you know, and my beard's down here. <laughs> So I walked out and Jesse's already in the middle of the yard. And he went, 
Fucking hell, it's Ben Gunn. <laughs> he said, you look like Ben Gunn. I said, yes, you are. <laughs> I said, what are we going to do? He said, look, we've had the telegram. He said, Let, let's come off it and then see what happens. So we did. And then I'll bring this to a close now, otherwise we'll be here for the last orders. <laughs> what happened is the governor was, he was wonderful, that governor. He came up to me one day and he went, listen, Rick, he said, uh, you've got a meeting. I said, I don't have meetings. I don't wear clothes, so you can't have meetings. Obviously, in prison, Rick, you don't wear clothes. He said, no, look, he said, the meeting's going to be in my office. I said, what? He said, the meeting's in my office. I said, in the governor's office. He said, there's uh, three fellas coming in to see you. So I said, okay. So the next day I had a pair of shorts on. And, and it goes up and there's two lads there that were new. One was a joiner from Kirby called Billy Jones. And the other fellow was a joiner from the Whittle called Alan Abrams. And the other fellow was an MP for Birmingham, I think, called Tom Littrick. I don't know whether you can check up on that. I think it was from Tom Littrick. And the governor said, listen, we want you to go home. I said, this is farcical, this. You want me to go home? I didn't want to be here in the first place. <laughs> he said, no, you've got to go home. I said, I'm not going. <laughs> I said, I'm not going. I said, I've, I said, I've done that. Just forget what I've done that about 16 months or something. I don't know. He said, no, we're not asking you. We're telling you. He said, you're telling me to go home. What's the idea of that? He said, what we've got to do is, he said, we're not worried about you, but we're worried about Desi. His health is, and he said, look, he's got an extra year to do. If you do your full two years, you know what he is, he'll do the full three. He said, look, so we want you to write a letter to him, but that's against the rules of business, right? Business. He said, but you can't tell him what you're doing, why you're doing it. So I said, I can't, he said, no, because you know what he is. Wrote a letter, dear Desi, listen, Des, we've had a good go now and blah, blah, blah. I'm missing the kids. I'm missing the kids. And the, the truth is, I think we should get, uh, I think we should, uh, you know, come to order now. Let's get out of here now. And he, so he wrote me this letter back, calling me a sniveling bastard and you've let me down. It's a bad, blah, blah, blah. Broke my heart. He's like sticking a knife in me. So I then, because I was living in North Wales and Desi was living in North Wales. I had to go to his house and see that everything was okay. And when I got to his house, there was problems. And I can't tell you people what the problems were, but I couldn't tell him. I couldn't get in touch with him. And I never, ever got in touch with him for a long, long time. And one day I'd started a little office thing and getting a bit of extra work. And I was going to work one day, there was a paper under the door. And it said there, uh, Rick, Desi would like to see you. If you could nip over to Chester. And there was an address. So um, I, 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 got my, I had a little card. I got a my card. And I shot over to Chester. And I knocked on the back door. In fact, that's where the parking was. So I knocked on the back. And a, woman, a woman's voice shouted, come in. So I went in. And she went in the front room. So I went in the front room. And he's lying on a mattress on the floor. And there's a, a rope. A rope from the mattress into the ceiling, screwed into the joist. And he pulled himself up. And he put his arms on me and he kissed me. And he said, do you know how long it is since we've seen each other? I can tell you, I, I don't, I haven't got a clue. And he knew, he knew to the day. And, uh, that was it. I still couldn't tell him what had gone on, and I thought it was just made up to see him. And then a couple of the lads started, you know, coming around to see him and all that. And then the next thing is, right, he, 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 he died. He died. And uh, I remember his funeral. I remember going to his funeral, and there was only one leader of a wonderful trade union who turned up to pay their respects. That's the man sitting next to me here. He turned up to Daddy's funeral. With a couple of members of the NUM uh, hierarchy. But I missed him, you know, I really, really missed him. He, he, was a, he was tremendous. He was tremendous. You know, it, sometimes you have to give a little bit and you have to say to him, Debbie, this is what we've got to do. This is what we've got to do. So, as you know, now it's, it's all history. After 47 years, they've admitted 
that it was a car vote from day one. Before the case went to trial, the magistrate, the, the, the judge and all the barristers knew that the police had redone every single statement that had been made. And they hadn't done them twice, they'd done them three times, each time making these statements worse and worse and worse. He was so sure that he needed a conviction. And as I say, that was the first, that was the first national building strike there's ever been. And I suppose I'm gonna cut this short now, get a bit upset. That's why I've got so much respect for these fellas. The last time I shed a tear over anything to do with the trade union movement was watching them miners marching back to work after a year and the brass bands playing and the chins held up in the air and they marched in and the tears just flowed down here. I thought, they're my type of guys, them guys. And why they haven't all got a fucking BC or a medal or something, I'll never know. Well, we've got the likes of Boris Johnson, that knobhead ruling the country. I love the miners and I love Arthur Scargill and long may they continue. <laughs> Uh, well, I want to say thank you to Ricky for that very stirring speech. It's a speech about struggle. It was a speech about pain, a speech about commitment, and probably above all, a speech about brotherhood of man and i'm proud to be here on this platform with ricky and i think it was an absolutely fantastic speech in the audience today there's a number of people i should mention i can't see them but i know that steve kemp the former uh National Secretary of the National Union of Mine Workers is here, travelled down from Yorkshire. Uh, and I just want to say welcome to Steve. Also, there's Paul Liversuch here, uh, an area official in the South, uh, in the South Derbyshire area for the NUM. And welcome to Paul. And there's David Douglas here. Uh, a Yorkshire miner with a very strong Geordie accent, a wonderful fighter, and is also a very wonderful salesman. He's wrote this book. <laughs> he wrote this book, Coal Climate Change and the total destruction of the British coal mining industry by David Douglas. Uh, so uh, he managed to, <laughs> managed to sell me this today. <laughs> I haven't had time to read it. But I will say this, knowing Dave and knowing his ability, both as a speaker, an orator and a writer, I'm looking forward to reading that. So thank you very much to those people. If I missed anybody there, I'm sorry. Well, our next uh, speaker is Ian Hodson, a, a president of the Bakers Union. Ian, it is a pleasure to see you here today and uh, the Bakers Union has close affinity with uh, mine workers and vice versa and we are proud of that. Comrades, please welcome Ian. Thank 
Um, comrades, sisters and brothers, an absolute privilege and a pleasure to be here today. Obviously, to, to Ricky and, and to all those people that fought for the Shrewsbury 24, you know, it's not often working class people survive to be able to celebrate a victory that found themselves the victim of, of the state. So to see actually people still being alive and being able to celebrate the fact that they were innocent and they were victimized by the state is so incredibly important for our class. And just as it's as important that we get justice for the families at Hillsborough, and just as it's important that we get justice for those minors who were abused and attacked by the police at Orgreen, it's about time. It's about time. Not to know peace or justice until that happens. Solidarity to the All Grief, Truth and Justice campaign. Obviously today, we're here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of what happens when working class people stand together in solidarity. Do you know what happens? What always happens when we realise our strength comes from standing together? We win. But something we seem to have forgotten, you know, Obviously, I was only eight in 1972. I would probably be able to tell you more about Action Man than I could do about Salt the Gate. But one thing I do know is in 1984, I was so proud to be working with the Blackpool Trade Union Council in supporting and raising funds to support those brave, courageous miners who were standing up, not just for the workplaces, but for the communities they live in too. Those people stood up and what happened to them? They didn't deserve and the trade union movement should have been there 100% to back them. That's what the TUC should have been doing. And let me tell you, what Arthur Stargill said, what they do to the miners today, they do to you tomorrow. Look at the state of our country now. People using food banks. We go out on a Saturday. People can't get mental health support. That's what happens when the trade union movement fails to stand up. Well, now is the time for the trade union movement again. It's time for the trade union movement to say, we will not pay for the cost of living crisis while the billionaires fail to pay for us. We will not pay for their crisis. We need to learn the history of Salt Lake Gate. We need to understand solidarity and we need to look at what Arthur Scargill did by taking the miners, those people that were so deserving, who've lived under our ground, that powered our communities, that powered our country and made them what they should have been, the backbone of our country, because that's what they were. And suddenly, gate, when those Birmingham workers came out in support, when those Birmingham workers stood in solidarity, that isn't an historic event we forget. That's an historic event we learn for. We stand together, we'll always win together. So it's an absolute pleasure, a privilege and an honor to be on the same platform because I never thought I'd get to do it with Arthur Scargill, somebody who has inspired me throughout my life. Thank yeah, you very yeah. much. Solidarity. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Ian. Fantastic. Passionate speech right from the heart. Our next speaker is president of the Indian Workers Association. Shira, we are proud to have you joining us today and speaking on this platform. Please welcome Shira Johan. Thank you. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, Chair. I'm honored to, uh, <laughs> to be speaking here with the real fighters of the working class. I mean, I was only about like 72 as a young lad, but we were quite involved in the 1984 minor strike with the Indian Workers Association. I found before, and but I recollect is that we really campaigned 
organized farms, organized accommodations on the miners are over here in, in the black country. And we really contribute and we build that solidarity with, with the working class in this, in this country. Uh, what I want to talk about is obviously talk about the miners. I want to talk about the, the farmers' struggle. They have parallels to, to the miners' struggle of 1974. When Modi was in power, he bought this act in, uh, which is anti farmers law, which is trying to take away the minimum support group. When the farmers take the crops to the market, they have a, the government pays the minimum price for them. What Modi wants to do was to, to get rid of the state markets and bring in big private markets, which we know what they would have done. They would have sort of minimum, not minimum price, but less. And that was anyway, that was the campaign that was conducted. And as a parallels to the 1974, the, the reason they have the campaign really was successful in the sense because they had built over the years, 40, 50 years, particularly the people on the left parties, they built amongst the masses through the through lifelong struggles, contacts, logistics, and campaign on that, on that fighting spirit. That was one of the reasons that the, that the campaign for the, for the farm was very successful. And this is one of the biggest, in, I think, in the world. The campaign lasted for so long, really over a year, and it's successful. And also, the, the other the important thing to realize is the leadership of the movement. We remember the, the Arthur Scargill, Rick and Tomlinson, and others. We said there was no sellout, there was no corruption, no leader amongst the 32, amongst the 500 organizations across India, not one of them was ready to be sold out or sell their working class or the farmers to, to the government for whatever money they could have wanted, they could have uh, had. But the thing that they stuck to the working class movement and also the, the, the other working class, the rail workers, the trade unions at the organizer strike, in one of the biggest strikes probably in the history of the world where 200 million people actually came out on strike. And that is what you would call solidarity amongst the working class, amongst one of the working class and the, and, and the farmers and stuff. They have their own contradictions, you know, the farmers and the farm workers, we know that the private landowners, all that, but that, that is a different matter. But through this campaign where Modi done a real great honor, on a good thing that he brought the people of India from different religions, from different castes, together where he was trying to divide people on the basis of religion, on the basis of caste, because that's what his politics was about, is to, to, to win the Hindu vote and to bring in Hindu, what you call a Hindu Rashtra, which will like a theocratic state in Punjab. But actually he was working for the big corporations and this fight was actually against the big corporations and the farmers had support from all across the world, from the trade unions, from this country, from Canada, from America, from South Africa. There's uh, the moral sport, which is very important, and also like economical sport. And also the logistics of thousand, maybe six, I don't know, maybe two, 3,000 people on the borders of Delhi. Can you imagine the logistics of that? Is keeping the, the, the fuel coming, the food coming. And that, that was because this organization over the years, they had links, community-based links, our village levels, because the Punjabi is a very agricultural society, small farm owners, people grow them. And there was an abundance of amount of food and supplies that were taken to the, to the borders. And that was one of the, also one of the biggest reasons that, that the campaign actually started so long, because that's because you have to have the logistics, the food and the fuels. And the other thing is, was we know the priest group brutality that was taken out. I mean, see, sometimes, what, what is it with the trade unions? So these are trade unions, the fighting trade unions. What they log is, you, when you're in the battlefield, you do not run. The police charge you, you do not run. You stand your ground and you, and you stay there. And that's if you look at the crossword initially when the master Delhi, the barricades were nothing. They had big barricades put in front to so try to stop the tractors coming in, but the people came across with the tractors and moved the barricades, the water cannons, people didn't care. They just marched forward and forward until they reached the borders of Delhi. And that is what you call the fire fighting spirit. And that spirit over, over years, decades of have been put, installed into the working class movement, into the ordinary people, that this organization. The other thing that I like to say, without any organization, we are nothing. We need to build these organizations into the community. And the trade union, union 
who also need to, to, to come out and build these, these strategic organizations in the community itself. Because when you have strikes, people come out and start, there's a support base where on the long, you can keep that strike going. I know it's not easy in this country here because everybody's, you know, everybody's in debt, you're in mortgage, you, you've got a debt, and you sometimes it's very difficult to stay out on strike for two months, three months. It's, it's not an easy thing. That's where the farmers was like a completely different thing. There are other, the children looking after the farms as well. But actually the ordinary working class, they maybe went on a, to, to solidarity for one, two days because they couldn't. Because some of them getting 200, 300 rupees, 400 rupees a day. It's very difficult for them to feed their families and all that. That's why we need that sort of build up. It's going to take years to build that solidarity and, and this, and this unity amongst only working class people, amongst the community. So when does a time come that we are? I mean, remember the Thatcher, when Thatcher says, I'm not for turning. Well, Modi also said, I'm not turning. And the farmers did turn him over on, where he, on the 19th of November that he put him there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, comrades. I have agonized over my introduction of our last speaker. <laughs> I have been a close friend and comrade of Arthur's for many years, but still find introducing him at a meeting to be a daunting task. How on earth do you introduce someone like Arthur Scargill and do justice? I have been working closely with Arthur for a number of years since he said he was retiring. That was a fat lie. <laughs> I am going to rely on the testimony of some others who have spoken generously of Arthur in recent times. Ian Lavery, the former president of the NUM and now an MP for Wandsbeck, in wishing Arthur a happy retirement uh, when, when he said he was going to. As leader, he said, as an advocate, an advisor, a friend, or a foe, Arthur Scargill represented the union with utter dis distinction. Described by many as the finest trade union leader, of all time, certainly a man whose dedication, and dare I say it, love for the miners and the NUM is unparalleled. That was a quote by Ian. In the past couple of days, in a Morning Star article, Andrew Murray, former chief executive officer, from Unite and was until recent times the personal assistant to Jeremy Corbyn said this. If one could take a single moment as representing the pinnacle of working class self-assertion in the 20th century Britain, it may well be the closure of the Salt Legate coat works in Birmingham by Mass Piketty. Some 20,000 striking miners and their local supporters overpowered police to shut the site in an emblematic confrontation of two powers, the working class on the one hand and the state on the other. Led by Arthur Scargill, this tactic helped secure the NUM victory in the most significant single dispute 
since 19 since the 1926 general strike. It epitomized a new militancy sweeping through trade unionism in those years. Today marks the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Salt Lake Gate. To observe it, Arthur Scargill, one of the greatest union leaders the British labor movement has ever produced, will speak at the meeting in Birmingham. He will be joined by contemporary union leaders, as well as celebrated actor and Shrewsbury picket, Ricky Tomlinson. There is a way to go before the 1972 example of the working class in Birmingham can be emulated. But learning the lessons of the action is important for today's trade unionists. Andrew adds in the final paragraph, I would urge everyone to get along. Chances to hear Arthur speak are regrettably rare these days and shouldn't be missed. Comrades, it is the greatest privilege of my life to introduce Arthur Scargill, President of the National Union of Mine Workers, 1982, 2002. Chairman. Chairman. Comrades, friends, it's a privilege to be here. And uh, I hope, I sincerely hope, after all these speeches of militancy, it will get a moderate view from me. <laughs> What Ricky didn't tell you, by the way, was that he and Des Warren and myself attended a meeting in Crook, County Durham. It was Des's last appearance. And I've got a photograph in my house of that event and to see the image of Des Warren and what the state did to him should be sufficient for any person who calls himself or herself a trade unionist to say never again shall we allow this sort of policy to be produced. And I'll tell you one thing, right at the start, people talk in this country about democracy, fairness, freedom. Well, they can make a start by releasing Assange, whom they held Don't tell the Americans to go to hell. His, his crime, he exposed the crimes of the United States, the CIA, throughout the world. And it's a incumbent upon us to stand firm on issues such as that, as well as today's event. In order to understand what took place in 1972 
and put it into context, you have to look back, yes, to 1926. I am privileged, by the way, today, and I hope you understand why. My grandson is in this audience. He's studying politics at Kiel. And I am told he's a left winger. <laughs> but I'm proud that he's here today to support me and to support the speakers on this platform. Welcome, In 1926, the Miners' Federation of Great Britain found itself betrayed by the TUC in the most terrible way. And we need to understand what happened then in order that it never happens again. On the 11th of May, 1926, eight, nine days after the general strike had started, the TUC had taken command of all negotiations. Four people went to see the Prime Minister. They asked for a meeting and they deserved to be named. On the 11th of May, Arthur Pugh, TUC President, Walter Citrine, TUC General Secretary, Jimmy Thomas, General Secretary of the National Union of Railwaymen, and Ernest Bevin, General Secretary of the Transport and General Workers Union, held a private, private meeting with the Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin. They informed him of this statement. This general strike is to be terminated forthwith. The TUC General Council the following day endorsed that decision. It was a betrayal and left the miners for nine months to struggle on in the most vicious political and industrial struggle of that period. I know that my father and my mother were both products of that period. I want to say to you that saltly is not something that just happened. It happened because of a series of events. Saturday afternoon, following my picketing, I then took a stint in the Barnsley office of the strike committee. We received a telephone call. It was from Jim Wheeler, the research officer of the NUM. And he said, we want some pickets to go to Birmingham to assist in picketing a coke depot. At first I thought it was a joke. My idea of a coke depot was a small depot that supplied local households. But it was serious. He said, can you get tickets to go down? As many as you can. 
Within two hours, we booked four coaches and 400 pickets en route for Birmingham. And I took a decision, together with the branch president at my pit, I was a working miner, that we were going to go down. I said, there's something different. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a call of this nature. When we arrived in Birmingham, we did so to a warm welcome because of people like Frank Waters, a dear friend of mine in the Communist Party, and Moira Simmons, the secretary of the Constituency Labour Party, working together to get accommodation for 400 pickets in a few hours. It produced some interesting situations. Two young men, about 18 or 19, said, Mr. Scargill, we're prepared to sleep on the floor. I said, all right. And then two young women from the University of Birmingham came up. There were rows of people offering accommodation. And they said, we can take two pickets. And these two lads who were going to sleep on the floor said, well, we could do our accommodation. <laughs> I reluctantly said, on one condition, that four pickets are on the picket line tomorrow morning at seven o'clock. And they agreed. And to be fair, throughout that strike, they were on the picket line every morning. I sought, I saw all that my, my, my area. What happened was phenomenal. How could we possibly pick it saltly? What was it? I'd never seen it. Next morning, we went down to the picket line. Well, what is not normally known, we closed the picket gates. We closed the gates at Saltley on the Sunday. The reason, we outnumbered the police. So the battle at Saltley started on the 5th. We were in for a lesson the like of which I've never known. <coughs> the British state were convinced that the miners would lose. For example, for those of you of a certain generation, you will remember a real right winger called Woodrow Wyatt. He wrote in the Daily Mirror, Rarely have strikers advanced to the barricades with less enthusiasm or hope of success. He said the miners have more stacked against them than the light brigade in their famous charge. Well, time would tell. And it was as a result of that telephone call that miners came into Birmingham. We were welcomed by the people in the Birmingham area. But above all, 
It was the trade union movement who gave us a warm welcome. And after the Sunday, I warned them. On the Monday, it will be a different story. And indeed it was. The police ranks had swollen by hundreds and battle royal had commenced. The bylaws in Birmingham at the time required the forking plant to close at 4 p.m. every day. During the course of each day, 700 lorries were going in to what looked like a small Mount Everest of fuel. 700 scab drivers. I was met by two men, Nicky Bridge and Alan Law, leaders of the TNG. I stayed with Nicky Bridge throughout the entire period. They said, we'll do all we can to give assistance. We met at the end of the day, each, each day, and held a meeting about tactics. In the Star Social Club, and also in the Labour Party office, working together. It was interesting to see the spirit that it engendered, not only amongst mine workers, but amongst the working class in Birmingham as a whole. Families were coming to the office to offer accommodation, and support. They were bringing food to help. Don't forget, the pickets had gone down. You know what? The call they had, they had. Nobody thought for a second that the closure of a depot would take more than a day. How wrong we were. But what a week it would be. By Monday night, it was obvious to us that something different was taking place. And as has been recounted to you already by both the speakers and of course by Ken, because he was there. You've never seen drilling like it from the police. They were replenishing the police force at intervals of an hour. We had to stand there all day. We said, start a chant. They're having to leave the ranks and be replaced because <coughs> they're knackered. In other words, keep our spirits up. But we needed more than that. We needed, and we knew it, we needed help. By the end of Tuesday, which was the worst day, many of our people had been arrested, including me. Many of our people had been injured badly. It was a battle royal, and we desperately needed help from the Labour and Trade Union movement. Arrangements were made by primarily Frank Waters and Moira Simmons to arrange meetings with trade unions, shop stewards, local branches, and wherever possible activists. 
I didn't know what was ahead for me. That evening, on Tuesday, two days before the famous 10th, I spoke at 13 meetings. I spoke first of all to the Transport and General Workers Union. They gave unstinting support and make clear that their drivers would on the Thursday morning stop their lorries, get out of them, take the keys and block the roads. And they did. I spoke then to a mass meeting of the AEU. And what a meeting it was. It was packed. And I made a speech calling for working class solidarity. I argued the case for the miners. I explained the hardship that we are enduring. I said from the 9th of January, we've been fighting. And whilst the movement have given us support, it is clear that they're going to make a stand and fight to the finish. And we've got to do the same. And I said, in an accurate statement, we don't want your pound notes or your sympathy. Will you go down in history as the working class of Birmingham who stood by while the miners were battered? Or will you become immortal? I do not ask. I demand that you come out on strike and join us on the picket line at Saltley. The chairman of that meeting was Arthur Harper. Totally committed. And he said to me, there's only one person I'm worried about in the entire hall. He always raises awkward questions. And so when questions were asked for, this man stood up and I was ready. I tensed, and he said, forgive the accent, you've heard Brother Skargi? <laughs> he said, I've only got one question. And I said, what is it? He said, what time do you want us there? <laughs> it turned down. His four brothers were miners on strike. <laughs> Such was the things that we encountered. I addressed meetings of NAFI, the Fire Brigades Union, the NUR, Bakers, all the unions. I got back to my lodgings with the chairman of the TNG in Bourneville, opposite the factory, at one o'clock in the morning. And we knew in a few hours whether or not we would be successful in at least getting some people to help us. I can tell you this, no one, and certainly not I, could have predicted what happened. On that morning, 10th of February, 1972, we marched down to the picket line. There was a strange, eerie silence. The atmosphere had changed. 
something was wrong or something was right. I suddenly realized there was no movement of cars or buses. There was no movement at all in the second largest city in Britain. I looked at the police lines and I detected a fear in their eyes compared with previous days. And suddenly a cheer erupted from the ranks of the miners. And I looked to my right and coming over the hill, full road, thousands, not hundreds, thousands of trade unionists led by a women's co contingent were coming to join the picket line. I suddenly looked the other way and they were coming from four other directions. I'd never seen like anything like it in my life. And as they came in, the chief constable, chief constable Kappa was his name, was trying to give an instruction that when they arrived, they should be moved on and passed through the other side of the police line. I heard him and through my megaphone I said to the rats that were coming, they want you to proceed through. I'm asking you to stand hard. <laughs> Not one person moved. They said, we stand. And they were piling up like a sandwich. Suddenly the whole area was full of pickets, not merely 4,000 miners from South Wales, Durham, and other areas who joined us, but 20,000, 20,000 pickets had come down from the factories that stopped work. They were on strike. It was a hell of a scene. And I remember there were chants, general strike. We ought to do this, Heath out. And I took up the chant, close the gates, close the gates. And if you have heard in a football crowd, the chant, whether it's an Anfield or wherever it is, it was similar, there was, chanting and each time they said something they move forward and they move forward towards the police lines and the police were backing away they'd know where to go and i went through the police lines and not i hadn't put me free even to go and so Derek Kappa, the chief constable, said, I'm going to close the gates. Two hours before, <coughs> Reginald Maudlin had told the cabinet that Saltley Depot will remain open at all costs. <laughs> and here was the chief constable saying, these gates are going to close and he confronted the gas works managers and said these gates remain closed until the end of the strike and they can be only opened by water loads of fuel provided it's going to go to a hospital, a school, to a care home, and to people in desperate need. And more important, he says, a driver will have to have 
a certificate signed by the NUM. But what could we do with this mass crowd? Well, here I was, 32 at the time, working minor. What do, what, what do we do? I said, the crowd. He said, can you disperse them? Will you do, will you do it for us? He's asking me. <laughs> And I said, yes, on two conditions. He says, what? I said, firstly, you allow me to make a speech from the top of that urinal. <laughs> it was 12 feet high. He said, agreed. I said, and secondly, can I borrow your I'll outspeak her because mine's knackered. <laughs> he did. And I went on the top of your rival with Arthur Harper with police equipment telling them you've done, just done the right thing, you've closed the gates. You can disperse that day on the 10th of February, 1972. You didn't just march. The working class in Birmingham marched into history. They took their place. I had never been more proud in my life. From the age of 15, I've been a socialist. In fact, I was in the Young Communist League for years. My class instinct came into play and I knew that we had achieved not only a victory, more important, we'd repaid what had happened to us in 1926. When I looked down on that crowd, I saw miners and I saw engineers and transport workers, engineers, drivers, with tears, tears of pride about what they'd done. They had achieved total victory. And Reginald Maudlin had to tell the cabinet the gates at Salt Lake have been closed. And since that day, it's frightened the living daylights out of every government we've had. Margaret Thatcher's autobiography. I know you've all read it. <laughs> but she, but she, she writes under a headline, Scargill's Insurrection. 40 pages. I think she might have fancied me. <laughs> the, first, the first paragraph was, we must never allow another salt lake. And of course, there've been more books, more pamphlets, more television programs than anything else. Because the miners and the working class of Birmingham demonstrated what could be achieved, provided they took industrial action. And I mean real action. 
strike action. It's time we learned the lesson. It's no good simply walking out for an hour. It's no good saying, we'll have a day strike. It's a class war. We're facing, for example, now an attack like we've never seen for 25 years on the working class of Britain. It's not only energy prices that's going up, prices of food all over, all over. And yet we've got oil companies and gas companies with trillions in profits, yeah. not millions or billions. And the talking in the labor movement and the labor party about uh, having a, a tax on it. I don't want a tax on it. I want the lot. Ricky, in his speech, explained very vividly what happened in 1972. Because it, as the chairman said, Ken, he put it so, so, superbly. 1972 was a year of struggle, class struggle. The miners' strike started on the 9th of January. It was followed by the Pentonville Five. They were jailed on similar charges for defying the law. They'd gone through all the procedures in court, the best barristers in the world. There was nowhere else to go. But I can tell you what Vic Turner said, one of the five people who was in Pentonville. He said, we settled down to the fact that we were in jail for the next five years. He said, and suddenly the cell door opened and we were taken to the warden's office. <coughs> he says, and in the warden's office, there was a, a flunky. He was dressed in these funny breeches <laughs> and a frock coat and a fully cocked hat, and he had a long stick. And the warden said, he has something to say to you. And he went, I, the official solicitor in this year of our queen, hereby say unto ye, from this moment on, you are free to go. <laughs> he says, well, I'm an inquisitive bugger. <laughs> I'll ask him, what, what's happened? He said, uh, can I ask a question? Yes. He said, how long have you had this job? <laughs> he said, do you mean me, sir, or my predecessors? Well, he said, both. He said, well, my predecessors from 1500. He says, me for the past 15 years. He says, and how many times have you done this? He says, this is the only one. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he said, it suddenly really dawned on us what happened. There were a million people out on the streets demanding their release. They didn't want a court to tell them. It was class action that got them freed from Pentonville. Don't say, we'll take it to the highest court in the land. Don't kid yourself. They're all the same. At the end of the miners' strike, I was asked 
to give a talk to the Law Society. And did I give one? <laughs> I said, in future, when we achieve a socialist society, judges will be elected and subject to five year elections. If it's good enough to say to a trade unionist, you've got to stand for office and re-elect, that it's good enough for a judge. Because the Time and time again, throughout the strike, we faced uh, all sorts of attacks. But in 1972, we were actually defying the law. We're, uh, we were act actually non-compliant. The policy of non-compliance is the policy I advocate. I'm a member of the Socialist Labour Party, not founded in 1996, as is generally thought, but founded in 1903 by a legendary socialist and Marxist called James Connolly. And just for the right record, I learned a lot from reading the history of our movement. And you learn from the past. And if you don't understand what happened to us in the past, you will never understand what's needed now. The strikers and the marches at Salt Lee in 1972 were emulated not only by the Shrewsbury campaign, of which Ricky ensured I was president, but also by the Bakers when we joined their strike as well. But more important, it was a demonstration that only by class action could we do anything that would, would change society. Heroes of mine often talk about what was really needed. Well, what was really needed in 1972 was achieved. But also we mustn't forget the heroes and heroines of the past. Because we've got in the audience today a representative of the Green and Common but women to demonstration. And what, what they did, they said no cruise missiles. <laughs> to put them in jail. And that they'll put under, under the microscope people like Des Warren and Ricky and any other trade unionist who dares to utter the word industrial action or strike. I went to, to my first area council meeting in Yorkshire. I was 20, 25, and I uttered an unspeakable word. I said something that sent shockwaves through the delegates who were assembled, and the, there were nearly a hundred there. And I actually called for them to strike, and the right wing leadership were appalled. <laughs> I thought I'd done something wrong. But it led Midas to begin to build resistance in Yorkshire and build resistance in other areas. We're facing a crisis now. And if we don't do anything about it, 
we will in a sense betray all of those examples that you've heard about today. We should refuse to pay these ridiculous sums of money that they're demanding. We should reject compromise like the current leadership of the Labour Party are consistently proposing. It's a disgrace that the former leader of the Labour Party would be thrown out by the new leader. And quite frankly, had they stuck to the policy of 2017 in the general election of 2019, I know we would have had a different government. Yeah. It's easy to say things that will say to you what you should do. Well, all I can say is learn the lesson of what's taking place in all the speeches you've heard today. Above all, read and understand. Listen and understand. We're living in a world of fear with threats from nuclear powers that unless there is a sort settlement to the advantage of the United States and NATO in the Ukraine, there could be consequences. Well, if they're serious about individual sovereignty, let's see it in action. I say to the United States of America, get the hell out of Cuba where you are illegally Stop telling us that we've got a right to the Falkland Islands, but it clearly belongs to Argentine. And above all, probably, abide by United Nations resolutions and say to the apartheid state of Israel, get out of the land that you're occupied. Don't forget for one moment, we can have a war by some mistake by these mad nuclear mad men from the United States and Britain. We're supplying arms to Saudi Arabia <coughs> in order to attack people in Yemen. Why are we spending billions on weapons of mass destruction when that money should be used to feed people? Give yeah, us yeah. a national health service. I can't spell the word compromise. Don't enter my axiom. I would have 250 billion as a budget for the National Health Service. I would ban all private medicine, all private hospitals. Our education system needs the money that other countries spend in order that we can have the same level of education as they. We are all should reflect on what's happened. We've got the queen in her 70th year celebrating, driving a German car. It used to be produced in Derby and it was sold to Germany. We sold all the works 
in the Midlands, which produce cars of the highest quality, and they're now owned by countries throughout the world. Engineering was transported abroad. It's time that we took the words of Gandhi when he said, you know, we should have self-sufficiency here and now. We've got the facilities. We've got possible power cuts. And beneath our feet, we've got the necessary fuel to power all that we need. We know that from coal, we can extract from liquid, which we can produce gas, oil, and petrochemicals. So why the hell are we importing oil and gas? Why are we dependent on purchasing food from abroad when we can bring our own, provided our farming industry is properly structured? And we can stop chopping down the forests of the world. The reason we've got a climate change is, is not because of global warming. Global warming has been caused as a result of the destruction of the Amazon fair rainforest. That, that's behind uh, all of it. The, the things that we've used have been wrong. And it's time that we put them right. I was president of the Energy 2000 Environmental Group. And I spoke with Petra Kelly, the famous environmentalist and socialist, who was uh, half Irish and half German. And she supported coal, provided it was with carbon capture. Well, if that was right then, in the 70s, it must be right now. And we, nobody in this country would worry about their energy bills. They could be spent in a nationalized industry. Our basic industries must be taken into public ownership. As a socialist, I want to see the means of production, distribution and exchange taken into the hands of people as a whole. In other words, the things that we fought for in establishing our movement. James Larkin and James Connolly, two of my heroes, legendary socialists, legendary trade union leaders who were responsible, by the way, for forming the Citizens' Army, warned that independence from an oppressor uh, at home or abroad will fail to free people if that independence is based on replacing one set of international capitalists with homegrown capitalists who continue to believe in the concept of a free market and globalization. We want to see an end to that kind of policy. I have been a member of a movement all my life, campaigning for socialism. I fought as hard as I could. I have done meetings when, yes, I've been ill. And people probably know here, I spent some days in the hospital only a couple of months ago. But all my life, I fought for socialism. And until the day I die, I will commit myself to campaign for a different system of society. I want to see the means of production, distribution, and exchange taken from them and given to the people. If you agree with that, then support those people who campaign all over Britain today. <coughs> today, 
like it was 50 years ago, is one of the proudest of my life because it gives me an opportunity to say a very simple thank you to the trade union movement and to the people of Birmingham who marched into history on the 10th of February, 1972. It's a privilege to be here. Comrades, Comrades, if I thought it was a daunting task introducing Arthur Scargill, let me tell you it's a far more daunting task trying to follow him. <laughs> there have been many struggles of the working class over the years, and often they've been described as defeat, whether it was Wat Tyler's fight in the 12th century against the poll tax, the toll puddle martyrs, and what happened to them, whether it was Peterloo and the massacre that took place there, or the 1926 minus strike often described as defeat. Tell you how I think of them. I think of the young boy who's leaving school to go home. He knows that outside in the playground, there's the school bully waiting for him. He goes out and sure enough, he's there. He has two choices. He can cower down and take his beating. Or alternatively, he can fight back. Now that doesn't mean he will win. The bully may be stronger and bigger than him. But he might land a few punches of his own. His victory is in the struggle itself. His victory is in the fact that he stood and he fought regardless of the odds against him. Comrades, today we have Woodrow Wyatt's of our own. <laughs> and there are a lot of them around. So the struggle goes on. Now I want to say that that's the end of the fantastic speeches that we've had today. I'm sure you will all agree with me about that. Dave Rogers is going to, from the Banner Theatre in a moment, is going to sing, close the gates. That was the chant at Salt Lake Gate. That will be followed by the clarion singers. Ian Scott will conduct the remaining proceedings and I will vacate the chair. Thank you for your attendance. It's been fantastic having you here. And let's never forget that Salty Gate was a victory on the day it took place. We didn't have to wait. We didn't have to wait for history to tell us it was a victory. When they closed those gates, it was a working class victory, the likes of which we have never seen. So thank you very much once again. And Ian now will take over for me in the chair. And thank you to all the speakers. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dave Rogers from Banner Theatre. We did a show about the uh, Shrewsbury Pickets. And we're also doing one now about uh, Salt Lake Gate. This is a song from that show. 
Paul close the gates and I'll introduce it with uh, the words of car workers, factory workers, miners, who he introduced back in 1972. Imagine you're down at Salt Lake and you don't know what's going to happen, waiting to see if it's going to happen. Everybody was waiting. It got to about nine o'clock. Now, they, call, they get to work at 7.30, call a meeting immediately. Tractors and transmission is 25 minutes walk away. Eight o'clock, they should be down here. Half eight, they're not down here. Nine o'clock, they're not down here. I've got a splitting headache, so it takes a walk up to the traffic lights. There was a growing feeling of apprehension amongst the police. And instantly we recognized there was something wrong. There was no traffic moving. Something was coming off. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Wave after wave of them coming over the hill. There was grown men down there with tears in their eyes crying. It made you go cold when you walked down to Salt Lake and saw that vast crowd that was gathered there. The way nothing was moving, not buses, not nothing. It was just a solid mass of working people. I was proud that day, really proud of the unity of Birmingham. The miners did us a good service that day. They united the whole trade union movement of Birmingham. I got to the corner. I looked up the Washwood Heath Road. There they come, eight, nine abreast. Arthur Harper at the front, you know, barrel chested. They got this big banner. The miners struggle is our struggle. That's why they've been so long. They've all been making this banner. I thought, I'm an engineer. I'm going in with this lot. Rover workers came, close the gates, close the gates, but fish is just the same, close the gates. The women from SU, the Morris workers too, to salt the gate they drew, close the gates, close the gates, to salt the gate they drew, close the gates. Down Bromford Lane we came, close the gates, close the gates. We marched along Dews Lane, close the gates. Down the time and road, with heads held high, we strode. Our banners fill the road, close the gates, close the gates. Our banners fill the road, close the gates. A solid wall are we, close the gates, close the gates. Our strength is unity, close the gates. We marched across the years through hunger, doubt and fear. We are the engineers, close the gates, close the gates. We are the engineers, close the gates. You men of high renown, close the gates, close the gates. You servants of the crown, close the gates. No power in the land can gain the upper hand. When we united stand, close the gates, close the gates. When we united stand, close the gates. That day when I saw the banners of the Birmingham working class coming over that hill, it reinforced forever my belief that workers are the salt of the earth. And to be part of their destiny is the true adventure of our time. That was David Miller. Tellingly, NUM, South Yorkshire. A solid wall are we, close the gates, close the gates. Our strength is unity, close the gates. No power in the land can gain the upper hand. When we united stand, close the gates, close the gates. When we united stand, close the gates, close the gates, close the gates.
needy and scot. Year round. That's you. Right. If I can come by then, I can lead you to the rest of the proceedings. Okay. We'll find my friend. What? Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, no. You're going to do it from there. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Okay. Okay. To all of you that know me or don't know me, my name's Ian Scott. I'm chairing the final part of the uh, of today's session. Today's event was planned by the subcommittee of the Birmingham Trade Union Council and uh, members of the Socialist Labour Party. Naim Malik, delegate to Birmingham Trade Union Council, John Terrell and Dave Rogers, and three or four other people who aren't, sadly aren't with us today. So can we have a big round of applause, please, for John Terrell, Naim Malik and Dave Rogers. Now, without any further ado, I know time is running a bit short. We'll now have the clarion singers. You can come forward, please. Oh, and whilst they assemble, please remember that today's event cost us a lot of money. And there'll be a, a little bowl walking around, a little bowl there, going around, collecting donations to help pay for today's event. We take coin, banknote, check, visa, this budget, gold teeth and jewellery. If you can convert it to cash, we'll take it and use it. Okay? Please be generous. There'll be more announcements after the cloud and signals are finished. <laughs> Today when those who rule divide 
we must be standing side by side, our eyes look all with courage and pain. Bring out the banners, bring out the banners once again. Clarion Singers. Excellent performance as always. Yeah. Okay. Now, there is a bowl going around the room collecting donations. So please be generous. Now the money will help fund future activities. The Birmingham Trade Union Council, along with Socialist Labour Party and other trade union organisations, the London Trade Union Council will be organising future events. Now, the first one will be on the 1st of May this year, where we will, we will, we will be working in conjunction with the NUM and SLP to arrange 
a 50th anniversary on the May Day event itself, of which any former car workers, any former engineers who were present at Salt Lake Gate will be entitled and invited to participate in large events. So, if you leave your name and addresses or email addresses on the register at the back, we will, we will be in contact with you. Yeah. Donations, why are they necessary? Well, first of all, at the Birmingham and South City College, Big Bus, they have a fantastic mural about 30 feet, about 30 feet by 20, a depiction of the Salt Lake Gates in 1972. Unfortunately, that mural needs to be fully restored. And we also need to find a permanent home for it. So that's where we are on that one. But again, that's a future project because we need to find out where a permanent home can be found. Likewise, we've also a campaign on the go for a permanent feature on the site of Salt Lake Gate itself. Now, whether that will be a plaque on the wall, we don't yet know, or it may be a small building or a statue or something, we don't yet know. Unfortunately, or fortunately, but opinions are divided. Certainly, it's up for redevelopment. The whole area is being redeveloped. So we don't yet know what the feature will be. But any funding we do collect will go towards a feature, either a plaque or build a statue or what have you. That'll be a permanent reminder. Now, more importantly, the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery are developing a digital archive and plan to include memories of the Saltley Gate. We wish to speak to anyone involved in the uh, Saltley Gate of 1972. My father was there, but I can't speak on his behalf, unfortunately. But, but any of you who are old enough to have been there will be invited to the, to the archive resources of the Birmingham Museum. Unfortunately, Polly Goodwin, who's running the archive, is unable to be with us today. But again, once we have all the contact details, you will all be informed about the archive and if you wish to participate, you're more than welcome to do so. <clears throat> now, um, unfortunately, well, fortunately, that now brings us to the end of today's proceedings. So, I'd like to thank all of you for your attendances today and wish you all a safe journey home. I look forward to seeing you again on the 1st of May at our event. Operated, <coughs> sorry, women operated by the Belgian Trade Union Council. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay. Right. Okay, so that's all the money I've collected. Oh, happy with the end of the